everybody welcome back to tour united the walk i am here with mr chet jacobs from waynesville georgia thanks for being on today thank you so um as y'all can see again we're at sukkot uh getting as many interviews as i can as possible and uh, i've had the pleasure of uh, being able to sit down with mr jacobs you by the way you gave a fantastic testimony this morning um and uh, i was very pr privileged to hear that um, but, uh, so basically, um, can you tell us a little bit about what your life was like before you, before you came into Torah? All right. I've pretty much been raised in church my entire life and, uh, I've been pretty much in the Pentecostal churches, so I'm familiar with the move of the spirit and all these types of things. And, uh, as time progressed and I've it was involved in different ministries as, as a young man. And one day I got a hold to a book. And the book is called Fossilized Customs. Heard of it. And when I read this book, Lou White wrote the book. And Lou White, he challenges you in every aspect of your walk of your religious life. And when I began to read these things and examine, find out this guy's right. This guy is really right. And there's a lot of things we're doing here as Christians that really just doesn't, doesn't fit the book. And the more I examine, the more I learn, the more I realize I've either got to, I've got to be obedient to my father or else I can live in this facade, this great illusion which is spoken of in Second Thessalonians. So I made the choice in my life that from this time forth, I will follow you, Father, whatever you ask me to do. I will. I will walk in your commands. I will be obedient to you in all my ways. And this took place for me at a time in 1999, and it was just before Christmas, and my wife was very much involved in Christmas, and she was putting up her Christmas trees and adorning the house with all the lights and all the beautiful stuff, and I began to tell her, baby, this isn't gonna work. This isn't gonna work. We've got to study this out because what we're doing here is an, it's, it's wrong. It's an improper ritual according to the words of, of Elohim that uh, we've inherited and we don't even realize what we're doing. And anyway, we made it through that, but she did She did not deny that, that she, or say that she, she's going to do her Christmas. She's going to do it. After Christmas, we'll talk about this. So we did, and after Christmas, I got her to read some of the book, and I got some of the studies that I had been doing, the searchings. And got, it, and got her to read it and go over it and look at it. And, and she, from that point on, she was on board 100% with me. And we've walked this walk now, I say, since 2000. And because uh, it really right close to the end of 1999 when this happened. So we've been in this and uh, we home group as Messianics and, uh, for a number of years because as I was walking in this I didn't know of anyone I mean I didn't know of anyone that's really obeying and walking and learning Torah I mean I was, we were like and where we lived there was there's no messianic groups and none of this was taking place so I had friends that were in, interested as we were and I asked them to come in come in with us and let's study let's learn Let's study the Word of God and find out what really are we supposed to be, what does His Word really say? What is it we're supposed to be doing? And as we begin to study Torah, more and more people begin to come. They begin to word, begin to get out. And different ones, and we home group until we didn't have homes large enough to contain us on Shabbat. And we would come to have Shabbat that, uh, we would need a larger facility, so I started leasing some of the churches uh, 
pavilions as uh, they would have their uh, fellowship halls and things like this. We would uh, lease from them on, on Shabbat. But this didn't go over well because every time on Shabbat is when the churches has to prepare their, their, their lands and whatever they're going to do for Sunday. So they're in here, we're always in their way, and they're messing up our Torah study. So this didn't go over very well. But we've done this for a, a few years, a few, uh, several years. And fortunately at the time, where I live, I have 60 acres of land, and uh, a portion that I had, had already purchased, there used to be a, a gentleman lived on it and had a mobile home that I bought a section from him. So it already had a well and septic tank on this segment of land. And I told the people, all of them, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I've got some money saved up because I had intentions of buying some more property adjacent to my land. But I'll take this money and put us up a metal building. And if we'll all pitch in and we'll furnish the inside, we'll build the walls, the bathrooms, and the kitchen. We'll, we'll do all that ourselves. But I'll just put up the metal building. So this is what we've done. And we've been in this metal building, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember if it was 2005 or 2007. My wife knows exactly about the year. But anyway, that's all right. We've been in this building ever since then, and we have had hundreds, hundreds over the years have come and studied Torah with us, and this has been a, such an amazing thing of how uh, we've got involved. I've got opportunities to. Get all of my children. I mean, they just when we started learning this, and I started explaining to them and teaching them, they just fell right in. And we all lived together on the on, this, on the properties. When I bought this land, I offered every one of my children, if you'll come back home, I'll give you, I'll go ahead and give you your properties, because you're going to inherit it all anyway. It's going to be yours anyway. But you can go ahead and have it now. We want it now. It costs you nothing. And so, all my children live there with us. That's awesome. So, so all so, of your children are Torah observant now? Right. Fantastic. And so we're all there and our place, our farm, when you come up to our place, we've got a big wagon wheel up there and we got wrote on it, Shabbat Land. That's, <laughs> that's the name of our place. It's called Shabbat Land. And so we have an assembly every Shabbat and like I say, we have people and what's so amazing to me is how Yah orchestrates and does this stuff because out of that, I have never in my life, I've never been, I didn't, I didn't go to college. I've never been to any seminary schools for uh, Bible studies or Bible colleges or anything of this nature. So I really felt absolutely inadequate to be one, to be a leader of God's people. I mean, who am I? I'm not an educated man. I just got a high school grad diploma. That's it. And but Yah opened the doors to where I was at, and all of a sudden, here I am called, and all of the people are looking to me and calling me the elder of the group. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did I get this? How I mean, how did I fall into this? And I've had. Over, over time, and I've been to Israel a few times, and I've had several of uh, Jewish friends who are rabbis and all this, and they say, we need to get you ordained. We need to have you ordained. And every time anyone's ever asked me, I say, no, I do not want to be ordained under any of the rituals of what man has given me. If Jehovah wants me to do this, he will equip me with whatever I need to do, whatever I need to say. I trust him. I trust him, and I'll do. And so, here I am. We've got a group now we call Gahal Shaka, and we've been putting on Sukkot's like this for ever since, uh, gosh, uh, 2004, I think, was done our first one. So, we, your group puts on this, this Sukkot? You're here this I week. did not realize that. Are that we? is awesome. Thank you. Yes. I mean, it's it, it's grown significant because we've got, it has grown significantly. We've got, what, close to 400 people here this, this year? Right. Right. That's incredible. 
So you've been, how did you say the, the group name again? Gahal Shaka. Gahal Shaka has been going on since you said around 2007, roughly? Somewhere in there. Okay. Well, well, before then, no. Okay. No, before then, about 2000 is when I first started. Okay. But we never, we, we never uh, had our own place. Right. And actually came up with a, a title. And you have to do this when you have an organization and you're going to have a, a, a banking account or whatever and all this to, to keep the facility running on. Right. You have to have a name title and all this kind of stuff. So that's where we come in. And the Gahal is the assembly and Shaka is worship. worship. So we're the assembly, assembly of, of worship. worship. That's awesome. <clears throat> that is awesome. So you said, so kind of rewinding the clock back a little bit. So you said you grew up in a Christian home. Right. So were you saved as a child? Uh, to, uh, obviously to, to Jesus or Yeshua? Uh, or? No, I, I floundered a lot. Yeah? I played church. Yeah, I was raised in church, and, and yes, I went to church. I mean, I had to. You know, my parents, right. you know, so, so all this kind of stuff. But to actually, I never had a true, honest relationship to know that Yeshua is my Messiah until really, I guess it was after I got married. And the way I, I came to know my Messiah truly for myself without just being in church and going, I mean, I hit the altar, oh my gosh, hundreds of times. I hit, right. the, I hit the altar and I'd make these confessions, oh Lord, if you'll just cleanse me from this or I won't ever do this again, I promise you. I'll, and then next week I'm right up and acting the same way, doing the same <laughs> job. I mean, what is that? That's just, you're just floundering and you're fooling yourself. You're not being honest in your own heart. Until you personally ask the Messiah, to forgive you, to redeem you, and let you be born again into his kingdom. You don't really know it. You just you're playing games with yourself, you're playing with your emotions and your 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 life. Yeah. So and the way I came about this, honestly, was one night my wife and I were, were sleeping and I had a dream. I had a dream and at this time I knew nothing of Torah. I was all church, and, you know, whatever, whatever, and, and I would just play church in and out, go just, just to be social. But I had a dream, and in my dream, that the Messiah came because I believed at that time I believed in rapture. Okay. And uh, and at that time, I dreamed that he came. And I was on my job where I worked at, the, at that time at, a, at the Babcock and Wilcox Company in Brunswick, and we built uh, fossil fuel generators. I was a, a, a metal fabricator. But anyway, uh, the, the Lord came, and I was working the night shift, and it was during the night. And all, every, all the sky, everything just lit up and was glowing bright. And... I couldn't look up, and I was, and I did, all the men in the in the shop, and all was running and just screaming and crying, and I, was, and I asked, "What happened? What happened?" They said, "The Lord just came, and we didn't make it." All us men are standing there, and we're all just, "Oh my God, we didn't make it!" And I remember very vividly looking up the hallway of the place here, and my dad was coming and he was weeping with all his heart. And I walked up to him and I grabbed my dad and hugged him. And he says, son, we're left behind. And I woke up out of my dream. It was all a dream. I was soaking wet with sweat. And I fell on my knees on the side of my bed right there and I wept with all my heart. And I pleaded, please, Father, please forgive me and don't let me be left. Wow. And that was my my encounter with knowing the Messiah for myself. We am crying out for my heart for myself. About how, how old were you when, when you had that dream? That was, I was probably, uh, I would say around 25. Okay. All right. So you were in your mid-20s when yeah. you came to, came to, like, truly came, truly. To, truly yeah. came to Christ. And you, so you found fossilized customs. 
about what age were you when you found fossilized customs and started realizing stuff was wrong? Uh, about 18 years ago. Okay. I'm 62 now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So you've been in you've been in Torah for roughly 18 years. Right. That's a long time. It well, for, well, like for, well for, time. for 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 me that yeah. seems like a long time because I'm only 28. Well, I'll be right. 28 this year. But that's that's incredible. So, uh, how do you see that your life has changed since you've come to Torah? And I know that's a very loaded question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It but it's changed dramatically because before, always, always as a Christian and living it as the Christian life, it was always a struggle. It was always a burden to try to keep yourself clean and try to say that I'm living I'm living for the Lord I'm living I'm trying my best to do but after I came to Torah it's like it's not a struggle anymore it's just it's just what you do right it's just your lifestyle I mean I don't do this I'm not here at Sukkot and doing all this because it's a commandment it is a commandment but I'm doing it because this, this is what I do. Yeah. It's my life. I mean, he does it, command it, but you do it but, because you love him. That's right. And after a while, it becomes, it's just, it's just what you do. Yeah, I tell you what, I, mean, just, I don't think there's any other commandment I'd rather keep than to go. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a, every Shabbat, every Shabbat. I love Shabbat. I love Shabbat. Shabbat, and, Shabbat. Shabbat and Sukkot. They're yeah. just fantastic. And, uh, I remember when I, I know me personally, and I, I, when I first came into it. I remember it's like, oh man, Shabbat's here again. But it, you know, after a little while, it's like, oh, when's Shabbat coming? You yeah. know, it's that every yeah. week. It's like you know, you're waiting on it. So that's fantastic. Yeah. That is fantastic. So if you don't mind, mm -hmm. um, I haven't asked this to anybody else, but you shared that testimony this morning. Uh, can you share it again? I can. I can. Okay. And uh, before I came into Torah. I got involved in the prison ministries, and working in the prison ministries, I was uh, involved with what is known as Kairos, and it's a corporate group that goes into the prison and, and shares, and I've done this for several years, and at different times, uh, different events would take place, but at this particular uh, event that she's asking me of here now is we do a little, I had a, each one has a table group. I was a table leader, and I have your little group, and I had like seven men at my table that I'm ministering to. And I told the guys, I said, well, what we're going to do, guys, is just a little one-line prayer residual. I said, in other words, I'll start us off the show. So we're all standing up, and we went in a circle. And I said, guys, I said, I'm start off. I said, Father, I just thank you so much that you called me to be your, your servant and to come, and you've given me the, the heart and the compassion to come and share with these men the love that you've put in my heart, and you have that same love for them. All right, what do you have to say next? And then, you know, so we just go around the line. The time we go around to, like, the fourth guy, he just, it comes his turn, and he just looks straight at me, and he says, Chip, I don't know if I believe in anything. I don't know if I really, I don't know if there's even a God. I don't know about any of this kind of stuff. I don't know that, you know. And I looked straight back at him and I said, that is good. That is good. And all the guys looked at me like, what? What you mean? <laughs> what you mean that's good? I said, he's being honest. I said, being honest is the first thing it takes to come to know the Messiah. You've got to be honest. If you're not honest to yourself, you're deceiving yourself. I played this role as a young man all my life. I can tell you, you're just deceiving yourself. Until you honestly come before him, you won't never know him. And so I asked him, just hold on. I'm going to come back to you. So we finished going around the prayer line. And the whole time as these other men are saying their little prayer line, I'm really not listening to them. I'm praying in myself, Father, what do you want me to say? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to handle this? What are you wanting here now? And uh, they all got
about finished, and it comes comes back. And I said, okay, Rob, back to you, buddy. I want to ask you. I said, and I, only thing I needed to say was, do you really want to know if there is a God or not? And he said, yeah. I said, okay. If I ask God right now, this moment, to do something to you that only he can do, that no man on this earth, no one can do, but only God himself. Would you let him do it? Would you want it to do, Would you want to know? He said, yeah. You're a real nonchalant. And I said, yeah. I said, okay. Could I hold your hand? He put his hand out. I took his hand and I put my hand over his hand. And I said, Father, I'm asking you right now to do something to him that only you can do. No man on this earth, only you that he will know without a shadow of a doubt that you are the true living God. And I ask him in the name of Jesus Christ. I, immediately, he fell on top of me, just like if someone had shot him straight in the head with a gun. Boom. He was dead as dead as this table. He was dead. Cold dead. Just dead. out. Boom. Gone. And we both, if any of you know, if any of you ever been in the, in the prison camps, you know in the, in the cafeterias and all, all those floors are terrazzles, hard cement floors. That's it. We went to the floor and he fell on top of me and fortunately when he fell, his head fell dead in my lap so it didn't just bust up on the concrete. So, when he goes to the floor, all the inmates and with all the table there and all that, we had 42 inmates in the cafeteria at this time. Well, the guys with me especially, they said, oh, do we need to call the guard? Do we need to call when you get help? And all that. I said, no, 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 please, everyone, calm down. Please, just calm down. He asked for this. He asked, could he know if there's really a God or not? Right now, every one of you men standing here are, are getting to witness and see God is taking out a heart of stone and putting a heart of flesh in this man. You keeping calm during that, though, I just, I can't, I can't fathom. I mean, if a guy just drops dead right in front of me, I'd probably would have panicked. So. Well, this isn't my first event. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this is just one of the times this happened. I've had people slain before, oh, you know. Wow. But that, this is just one of the testimonies I'm telling that took place. This one of many. So all the guys so, were freaking out, and you're telling oh, yeah. them to calm down. Right. And calm down and just be calm because God is doing so then I begin to explain to them what is taking place and how in the book of Acts that it tells us about that after you believe since you believe have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit I said and this is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does it endues you with power from on high to call on the Father that he will hear your plea because you are now an advocate to the Father. And when you call on His name to ask whatsoever you will in His name, if He wants it to be done, it'll happen. It's just that simple. It's as simple as that. And so, when I called, and the Father touched Him, and He was out, and He was out for a few minutes, I had time to really go through some, a good bit of Scripture. But anyway, he comes to, and when he comes to, he is just so broken. He is so broken that uh, <clears throat> he can only, uh, <laughs> tears, tears are flowing from him like you can't imagine. And mucus running and all, I mean, he's just, he's, he's broken, completely broken. And all the inmates that are there by this time, the whole entire cafeteria, all the other table leaders, everyone is involved because they think something dramatic has happened. And if it was something dramatic happened. Yeah, he came back to so, life. So he comes to, and when he comes to, he's trying his best to get breath, to get breath just to breathe. <laughs> I believe, I believe, I know. I know, I know there's a living God, I know. Every inmate, we had 42 inmates. Every single inmate in that cafeteria fell on their face, squalling and crying. 
And I was like, you're such an awesome yacht. You are Hallelujah. so amazing. Hallelujah. You are so awesome. And uh, that was an amazing day for me. A very amazing day for me. This doesn't happen all the time. But there's other stories. I mean, the stories that I've seen, I've just seen the hand of God do some miraculous things. And it's only when when he, I might say, I can just go, I have a gift of healings or none of this right, kind of stuff. Right, right. No, no. It's all him. But it's him. It's his glory. It's his honor. And if, but what I am, I am saying, anyone, anyone who believes, if you believe in his word, you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be trained in some type of session of seminaries, colleges, or any of this type of stuff. All you have to do is simply believe 